Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to Dr. Brown Medical for having me speak today on feeding challenges in infants with congenital heart defects and the heart of the matter. Um, I like this heart because feeding is at the middle of it, but we know that there's a lot of other things involved before we even feed, especially with infants with congenital heart defects. I have no disclosures. So at some point in your career, you will encounter an infant that has had open heart surgery or a young child or even an adult. One in 100 babies are born with congenital heart defects. That's quite a large number compared to other childhood diseases. You need to look at the progression for the newborn. Where do we begin? And myself as a clinician, 10 years ago, starting to work with these infants, usually when they came to step down, we were usually consulted when they were getting ready to go home and they still had a tube. I then started working at the bedside with patients that were extubated and I was told, well, they fed before surgery, so they should probably be fine. And what I found working with others, and it's been a joy working with others across the nation, just trying to figure out how are these babies similar to premature infants? How can we use some of the systematic approaches? But also, how are these babies quite different in their journey to feeding? So, feeding is a journey, but sometimes the destination can be up and down with highs and lows, twists and turns. A lot of times these babies can be moving forward and then take a step back they may experience an infection. They may need increased respiratory support. They may need to go back to the OR for another procedure. This can be really difficult for parents as they get excited when the baby starts taking a little bit, but then they're made in PO for procedures or back on continuous feedings. When we think about how the newborn comes into the world, we all know that the baby goes on the mother's chest and that moment where we're hugging our baby and talking softly to them, it's, it's a wonderful joy. But it can be a different experience for the parents that have a baby with congenital heart. Usually the baby's placed briefly on the mother's chest. The father may be able to look at the baby quickly and then they're taken to the ICU quickly for line placements, echoes, ultrasounds, many other pokes and prods and procedures. We need to consider state regulation and oral sensory motor. How do we build those experiences in an ICU? Looking at different experiences and equipment are going to be important when we look at feeding readiness and pre-feeding skills. Research shows that the baby with the congenital heart defect can actually have uh, hypoxia in the preoperative period in utero. Recent research has talked about poor placental health and poor weight association. The baby may be born full term, but they're acting more like a preterm infant. And there's evidence on MRI before surgery of periventricular leukomalacia at birth, especially in infants with hypoplastic left heart and transposition of the great arteries. So it's very important to start seeing these babies even before surgery. I've had nurses tell me, well, he's just waiting for surgery, he doesn't need any help, or we're not gonna bother with that one, he's just waiting to go to surgery, he's too critically ill. I think we've come a long way in that we are seeing that this is a crucial time to begin working with this baby and begin working with this family based on the fact that they're already born with some uh, risks for delays. So finding opportunities at my uh, institution, we started to think, well, should we provide information before when the mother's being diagnosed prenatally? Should we have conversations? And we found that parents are not overwhelmed. They actually would like more information and more support so that they can be prepared for this journey with their baby. So we may be meeting them at a visit. We may be meeting them in the fetal echo lab, providing literature, handouts. They get to meet the team visit the unit, but most importantly, my job 
is to find out what would, what's the feeding method you would like to choose? Are you thinking about breastfeeding? Are you thinking about bottle feeding? Can we talk about some systems that are better than others? Can we talk about how we can support breastfeeding if that's the desire? At my institution, we had parents um, only pumping and providing breast milk about 42%. And with education support and um, a lactation nurse, we are now at 90% and above of mothers providing breast milk for their babies. Even though they may not be able to bring the baby to breast right away, they're able to provide breast milk. And this is really important and empowers the mother that they're providing some help to their baby. There's two different kinds of defects and we wanna be sure that we don't have to know all of these defects and all of the surgeries, but to know which ones are going to impact the body. And we know that oxygen provides um, energy to the muscles and muscles are important for strength and coordination, especially with feeding and development. So something to keep in mind that our cyanotic babies are going to be a little more sick and may have a little longer journey, but not to say that if you have an acyanotic defect, you may not have challenges yourself. We never want to put a label on a baby according to their diagnosis. Also, neuroprotective care. We hear this a lot in the NICU world and with premature and, and sick infants, but we've also adapted this approach with our infants with CHD. And um, most importantly, these babies need a lot of neuroprotective care. They're already born into a world with a lot of medical procedures and not enough positive touch from their parents. So looking at low stimulation with touch, sound, even showing them little black and white uh, pictures if they're awake, having the parent participate in oral care, and even sometimes using milk swabs to stimulate the tongue. I had a lot of success recently with a patient that she was sucking constantly on the intubation tube. So we started to use the swab to work on tongue movement and input with the swab. And after she was extubated, she latched onto a pacifier immediately. It was like her brain knew what to do. So if the baby is um, sucking quite a bit on the intubation tube, we'll even use a tiny pacifier underneath the intubation tube with a little breast milk. Um, during a nursing assessment. And then most importantly, to add to state regulation and improving flexion, we want to look at containment and protection during nursing assessment. Neural developmental care and neuroprotective care, they go hand in hand, right? We're looking at opportunities to provide neural developmental care, and parents love a neural developmental care plan. They like to have a little schedule. It helps them feel empowered in the care of their baby. Often you might walk into a room and see a parent sitting in the corner and just staring at their baby. Our job as a neurodevelopmental care team in the unit is to help the parent come to the bedside, compliment the nursing assessment, talk to their baby, hold their hand, working to educate parents so that they feel involved with their baby's care. There's a couple really good articles that I'll show later that talk about implementing this with babies with CHD. I've even been present for procedures like line changes, um, intubation, and respiratory treatments. There's a lot of opportunities to provide this, not just when the speech OT or PT come around. So remember that neurons that fire together stay together, the good and the bad. So we talk about educating our medical staff and our parents about providing neural protection before, during, and after to help them recover, that we don't just walk away after the nursing assessment. We may stay another five, 10 minutes just keeping our hand placed on their head and their feet or keeping our hand placed on their, their um, body and having the parent talk to them softly. We look at the challenges with equipment. Um, this picture tells it all. There actually is a little human being in there. And sometimes it's our job to remind people of that. Our nurses and physicians and respiratory therapists, everyone involved has such an important part in keeping this baby healthy and, and alive. But we also have to remember there's a little human being, a brain. Um, not only are the alarms and the equipment making noises, but the other day I also recorded a little sound outside of the room because we can be loud ourselves and that's not always good for the baby.
Um, the fluids, yeah, I prefer um, LR. No, you know. So in addition to just the alarms, we also have to remember to keep our voices down and quiet. That healing brain needs that soft, low stimulation. We and our unit put little signs on the door that say, low stimulation, please, or quiet voice, please. It's hard to remind each other and remember, but if we take that effort, that's more helpful for the baby. So do you have strategies in your unit to make it work safely? Do you have ways to help a mother hold a baby? I had a nurse one time tell me, well, the mom already held the baby today and I have to go feed my other patient. And it's true, nurses have so many demands and so many tasks to complete. So in your unit, try to develop a team that can be readily available for transfers. Maybe it's a respiratory therapist, another nurse and a physical therapist or a physical therapist, speech therapist and a respiratory therapist. Work on a training program to help make um, holding safe. We don't wanna have where we don't have a program for that so we're not gonna provide it. It's so important to parents to hold their baby. Individual care, looking at family-centered care. So we get very used to numbers and percentages in ICUs. What's the flow rate? What's the lactate? What's the heart rate? These are important things to remember to keep the baby safe and to keep the baby um, going. But we also need to look at where's the individual care? Where is the soft touch? Where is the opportunity to provide um, nice care. It can't just be the numbers. We have to look at the individual baby, observe their behaviors and observe how they react to stimulation. And even though they can't tell us, they can tell us through their vitals, they can tell us through their behavior. And we can teach parents that to make it very individualized to that baby. We look at hemodynamic stability. Sometimes we're told they're too sick. They are having a bad day but are they too sick for a nursing assessment? Are they too sick for their mom to hold their hand? Um, we need to think about these things. And in your unit, think about how you can communicate this to the parent and the staff. But remember that PT, OT, and speech, we're there to help complement, complement the um, assessment, complement the procedure so that we can help the baby recover. So think about next time when somebody asks, could we provide neuroprotective care during your assessment, during your medical procedure? Are they too sick for that? Then they're not too sick for supports. So during the preoperative experiences, we wanna be sure to try to find opportunities for parents to hold the baby in their arms. In our unit, we have a protocol how we secure umbilical lines. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has a website um, with some where they've posted how to um, work on holding and feeding. And um, you can adapt a plan for your unit based on other people's plans. Trophic feedings, this is usually done for babies that um, are getting prostaglandin. And we have to be careful with preoperative feedings because of the risk of neck. But trophic feedings are important to help stimulate that gut, get that gut moving. And if at all possible, if the baby can take those trophic feedings preoperatively, we want to be able to provide that. Trophic feedings are not nutritional. We don't need to have, uh, you know, that the baby has to feed per cues or the baby has to feed every feeding. If the baby can get two or three feedings before their operation, that's wonderful. That's great. And we want to make sure that the parents involved for those because they're the most important person for feeding the baby, not you or I. And they, a lot of them do have baseline tachypnea and we need to keep that in mind. But also look at how we can work with that by adapting the flow of the nipple, pacing, positioning, teaching the parent. Sometimes maybe they're only taking three to six mLs. Um, and like I said earlier, securing the umbilical lines. Come up with a um, protocol for your unit, how to secure those so that parents can hold the baby. And then also like how many days before surgery? Sometimes there's not a lot of time. And um, this is a project that I'm actually currently working on with MPCQIC. I'll talk about that a little later, how we can enhance and make preoperative experiences standard for all babies. So they're all getting this. Postoperative experiences, looking at respiratory support. Of course, this is very important. And we think about this a lot with was following and um, how this can impact um, 
the risk of aspiration, but be creative. Look at some experiences. Again, it's not for nutrition per se, um, it's for experiences. And if we can provide good positive experiences with the parent, then we're going to get the buy-in later for when the baby does start to feed more and they are taking bigger volume. The earlier we can get in there to educate, the better. So if I have a patient that's been extubated to NIV pressure control, we might be starting pacifier dips that day. If I have a patient that's on high flow six liters, I may talk to the respiratory therapist and the physician about lowering that just for a small feeding of three to five mLs with the parent so I can start that teaching. We haven't had patients get aspiration pneumonia from this um, method. And yes, it does need to be further researched because we're looking at the infant with cardiopulmonary differences versus the premature infant with premature um, lungs. So we need to start researching that a little bit more, but also looking at nutrition, working with our dietitians on feeding tolerance. A lot of our CHD babies um, can have difficulty with vomiting and feeding intolerance, and this impacts the feeding experience as well. So again, how can we provide small, little experiences and opportunities? Sedation and pain, this is something a lot of our patients all go through um, after surgery. And how does sedation impact feeding readiness? And how does sedation and pain impact um, how well we'll be able to state regulate as we wean from um, sedation? We see a lot of this with hypoxia on top of it. So we get a lot of agitation. We have to look at calming strategies, work with your OTs and PTs, um, looking at the best position for the baby and the best ways to calm the baby for this um, positive experience. Looking at medical touch versus loving touch and then family involvement. We have standing orders at our hospital and most hospitals that I've spoken to within collaborators that I'm involved in have this as well um, before and after surgery. Sometimes it can be a challenge to get them before surgery because they're born and taken into the ICU right away and there's not a lot of time, but if you can get those standing orders, you can get in there sooner. And um, post-operatively, we actually get the order the day of surgery. We don't go in that day, but we know that that baby's on our radar and that we're gonna be following and watching for the baby to be ready. And if the baby's um, coming out of the OR, we're trying to get into the room that day and talk to the parents. This is your neurodevelopmental team. We'll be coming by and working with you. Physical therapy, of course, is gonna be working on positioning, promoting flexion and strength, which is important for feeding. Occupational therapy, working on state regulation and strengthening and speech therapy. Communication, cognition, and pre-feeding skills. Again, that baby may not look like they're doing much, but they're processing and they're starting to um, store that neurological information that will impact them later. So the brain and the heart equal a human being. It all goes together. And 10 years ago, when we started working with the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcomes Collaborative, I was really amazed how um, people didn't visualize the heart and the brain affecting the person that we thought, well, the baby has a heart defect, they have surgery, and then they go home. And it doesn't impact learning and it doesn't impact feeding. And now we know that hypoxia and procedures and sedation all impact that little human and um, how it can impact their anxiety and the trauma that they've undergone. So I think we're all getting better at looking at the cares for these babies and realizing that it's not just the heart that's involved. So how does your team work together? Everyone has a part or do you have that head physician that says, the baby's too sick. I don't know what you're talking about. How can you work on feeding and communication on an intubated patient? I have to say it is ongoing education, right? I still will go to a bedside and ask the mom, have you, have you held your baby yet? And the baby's four days old. And the mom will say, well, I, I held him at birth. And I have wonderful nurses that I work with and we'll just say, okay, let's see how we can make this happen and, and have the, the mom hold the baby. Have you been able to give your baby any pass fire dips? Well, no, nobody gave me any milk. So it's going to be a continuum of talking, having discussions and providing education. Again, the, this is our area that we learn about neural development. So we wanna make sure that we work together and um, that we continue to provide support and education to everyone. That's how we'll make it work. 
So teamwork. At our hospital, we have daily morning developmental huddles. Uh, we participate in bedside rounds um, and we talk about feeding and nutrition. And then we also during the week have multidisciplinary rounds with nursing, APNs, psych and social work. This is a great article if you haven't already um, read that talks about um, in pediatric care in the intensive care units. This is again, sort of a new approach. And then we talked earlier about individual family-centered care. It's so important not just to look at the chart and the numbers, but to look at the behavior of the baby. Look at the behavior of the baby with your nurse and your doctor, talk to your family, and create a plan that is unique to that patient. So when we do the oral feeding assessment, things that we need to consider, of course, if the patient's intubated, um, can we provide oral cares with the swab or the tiny pacifier with the breast milk or sterile water? Um, how much NIV, NAVA, high flow, CPAP is the patient on, um, but the baby has access to their mouth? So do we do pacifier dips? If the baby is wide awake, nice readiness and sucking, we may consider talking to the medical team about dropping the high flow for just the oral feeding. I have had some infants feed with NIV-NAVA um, because when we get them in sideline, um, the key to it is using a very slow nipple, such as the ultra preemie nipple um, with the first feeder. The parents love the first feeder because it's tiny and it's not so overwhelming and the five to three mLs don't look so tiny as they do in a bigger bottle. Um, and so what's nice is the small controlled bolus and how slow it is so that the baby actually can control it. And if we hold it sideways, even better in sideline. Um, so those are some ways to start feeding. And then as the baby comes down on respiratory support, we may increase the frequency um, of those experiences for the parent and the baby. And then as they in decrease even more, then we will provide even more volume. You'll see in a lot of my videos that I use the yellow slow flow nipple. That's because of a study that my colleague um, and I are doing that is the control nipple. So again, use a slow flow nipple. I have heard before the myth of, well, they need a faster flow nipple because they're weak and they can't get the milk out. But if we're giving a baby that is weak with poor base of tongue retraction and poor latch, a faster nipple, then they don't have good bolus control and we're putting them at an even higher risk of aspiration. So that's what you need to consider when um, picking a flow rate. And look at considerations like state regulation and respiratory support. Discuss if respiratory support can be adjusted just for the oral trials. Again, there's differences in the need for respiratory support with babies with CHD as compared to premature infants. We're looking at cardiopulmonary circulation versus underdeveloped lungs. And discuss the patient's baselines. Babies with hypoplastic left heart are usually satting 75 to 85. Find out what the normal range is first for your baby and discuss your baby's um, chest x-rays. Talk about the respiratory support. Are they able to come down? And it's not uncommon sometimes for babies to go up for respiratory support, come down, you start feeding, then they go back up again. Um, they could get a chylothorax. There's a lot of challenges, but again, continue to adjust your plan accordingly and always be supportive for that family. So considerations for oral trials. I love this picture that I found because I'll still see this method being used, even though this looks like a picture from 1960 and the nurse has the baby just laying in the bed upright. So it's real important to work um, in the bed if the baby can't get out of the bed and work on side laying position. We have more um, support things to use now. We have Z flows, we have blankets. It's nice to go with the OT and the speech to work on a feeding together. Look at the flow rate. That's really important too. Use a slow flow or the ultra preemie, something very slow. Again, we're just providing a nice gentle experience. We're not looking at the baby to wean off the tube right now or even before they leave the unit. Um, holding the bottle lateral versus up and down like this nurse has this baby sitting up and, and reclined and the milk's just going back. This is not optimal at all. This can cause a little bit of waterboarding and pacing for breathing. 
this is a really important method too to make it a positive experience. And um, like that bicycle picture with the heart and the brain, we need to make it balance. Determine a safe volume, volume and frequency. You know, it doesn't have to be 30 mLs. It doesn't have to be the full feeding. It could be five to 10 mLs with um, twice a day. And we will adjust accordingly to how the baby does. We never want to put the baby at risk for aspiration. And aspiration is a big key to this, but it's not part of the, um, it's not the whole picture. It's just a part of the picture. And the education to nurses and parents for a plan. I find that a lot of oral aversion and aspiration risks come when the plan isn't consistent amongst the team, that um, communication gets mixed up and somebody's like, yeah, but he looked like he wanted more. He was doing so great. It's really important that we train for the marathon. We wouldn't run the 26 miles in one day. We have to run maybe two miles and five miles and build up our endurance and build up our strength and build up those positive experiences. I think sometimes when it falls apart, that's when things get bad. Um, we need to consider vocal cord paresis with this population. Um, there's a higher risk for infants with um, that have surgery near the aortic arch, such as transitional great arteries and hypoplastic left heart. Some institutions um, have a mandatory ENT consult before feeding. Sometimes we will start pacifier dips, tastes, or even small trials with the infant prior to the ENT evaluating. Um, we started this practice because we sometimes have to wait on the ENT. Again, safe manner, safe progression, um, keeping in mind that aspiration is a piece of the puzzle. But you can see here where the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is very integrated with the aortic arch. So when we look at feeding recommendations, we always want to say, you know, do we feed the baby right side down because they're at a higher risk of left vocal cord paresis? And we've done this at the bedside, but I'm going to show you a swallow study later where it's always important to assess the baby on both sides because we just don't know. Sometimes they aspirate because of poor base of tongue retraction and weakness, and sometimes they aspirate because they don't have good airway closure because of vocal cord paresis. Again, we can assume a lot of different things, but all Always look at the baby as an individual person. We will limit the volume to five mLs two to three times per day. Maybe it's three mLs two to three times per day. Um, if the risk of aspiration is higher, consider pacifier dips. Always work with the medical team on a plan that seems the safest. Um, thickening is not always advised for certain defects because of poor strength and endurance. It may help improve um, their ability to take some by mouth and decrease the risk of aspiration because of the viscosity. But we find a lot of times that our babies with congenital heart don't have the strength um, because they have wide jaw excursions and they're just not able to extract thickening as well. But it's not to say that thickeners can't be implemented with these children. Okay, so I'm gonna play um, a couple video swallows for you and show you a little difference here. So I'm going to stop that one. So this baby aspirates right away on the bottle, but then has a couple good sucks. So I'll play that one more time. Baby latches, sucking, right away aspirates, doesn't cough or choke, doesn't have any strong signals where they're having stress. And this baby, whoops, we put on the left side and there's no aspiration, but really wide jaw excursions, several sucks per swallow. And a parent might say, well, he's just, he's, he's sucking, he looks great, he wants to keep going. So something to keep in mind that this baby's very weak. So again, looking at your feeding plan of care, think about we have to get our feet wet before we start to swim. And how can we get our feet wet with pre um, while preventing aspiration? and sickness and further complications for our patients. This is a tool that we use. It's called Three Strikes You're Out. 
and we talk to parents about aspiration signs or stress signs. So after three attempts, if we see coughing, gagging, refusal to begin, head turning, color changes, hiccups, respiratory changes, watery eyes, sleepiness, or emesis, we say we're going to stop at that time. So a lot of times, sometimes people will stop after the first strike and say, you know what, he's just not showing me that he's ready or that he's interested. But in order to help the brain learn, we have to get their feet wet. We have to have them feel the milk, feel the nipple, practice. And so we want to also be respectful and we don't want to overwhelm the brain and the body. So after three attempts, we stop and then we try again. If the parent came to us and said, you know, it's every time and it just doesn't seem like it's going well, we'll adjust the plan. Again, the word individual experience is the key. The feeding plan of care is so important. Make sure you're providing positive experiences. Make sure you have a measurable volume and frequency to avoid aversion. Always try to do it with the parent. If they can't be present, call them. Do teach back with the parent and the nurse or other caregivers so that the plan is clear. Coordinate with the dietitian for improved communication and update frequently. In our unit, we're updating these plans almost daily before the baby goes home. It has to be really quick. So I just want to show a video of a couple babies and I call it newborn or CHD because not every infant always looks perfect whether they have a congenital heart defect or not. So this is an infant who is 12 hours old and she does not have a congenital heart defect. But see how she's a little discoordinated on the pacifier. Look at those eyes. She's, oh, she's looking a little stressed, not sure. And then her mom's gonna give her the bottle. We'll see what she does with that. So some would say, well, I'm not gonna feed that baby. They weren't able to latch on the pacifier and they looked a little discoordinated, nice strong root. Latching, oh, she's interested. <laughs> but again, we know that this baby progressed and, and, and went home feeding. And there she goes. Here's another newborn. Kind of sleepy. It's feeding time. Sucking on the pacifier. Nice. Here comes the bottle. Oh, he latched. He looks hungry. Oh, he's sucking. Looks great. Look at him go, he's so hungry. He's starting to open his eyes up a little bit. Maybe it's just too bright. Oh, here comes some milk. Not sure he's controlling this bolus very well. And maybe he needs a slower nipple. Here's a preoperative feeding of a baby that's on a little oxygen. Sucking on the pacifier, nice, alert, and awake. Rooting, opening. She looks great. And this baby did not have limitations. She was not on trophic feeds. This is a preoperative baby with hypoplastic left heart, and she's with the mother. Um, the positioning is not desirable, but um, I also try not to overwhelm and give the parents too much feedback right away um, because I want it to be a nice social emotional bonding moment. And then after the feeding, we might talk about some modifications. So that's why the baby's in this position. She's also a little drowsy. Um, this is before surgery. She is on prostaglandin. Clinically, I've found um, that prostaglandin does make them drowsy. Remember the other newborn baby that had her, um, his eyes closed and, but she's starting to suck. Her vitals are good. So she kind of looks that, that second baby that was a little drowsy and tired, but looks safe and, and actually finished this bottle. Here's the same baby after surgery. Again, I think sideline position would be best for her using a slow flow nipple, tongue's coming out a little bit. 
but doing okay. Here's another post-operative baby. Kind of looks like that first baby a little bit that we saw that first newborn, but starts to latch, starts to suck. We're looking at the vitals. The vitals look good. He looks comfortable. Sideline position. And he looks very engaged, looks comfortable. Okay. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some sample goals because um, I think sometimes people are like, well, how is that speech therapy? How do I justify that? So think about oral sensory stimulation, providing neuroprotective cares for pre-feeding skills, provide education to the parents so that they can start to implement gentle, gentle oral sensory stimulation. Um, also, the speech therapist can help provide an individual plan of care for pre-feeding and neural protection. You would make these goals measurable based on the assessment and the experiences that you've observed. Tube weaning um, after surgery. Uh, again, we have a handout in our unit that we provide to the parents preoperatively. It's called the feeding journey. It talks about how our team will support the parent through the journey, but also most importantly, preparing them that they probably will go home with some sort of supplemental nutrition. It depends on your institution. Some institutions um, keep babies longer and other institutions send babies home sooner. So um, there can be sort of this race and pressure to develop a tube weaning plan at discharge. But most likely we tell parents, look, this is very normal. They'll probably need supplemental nutrition. We found in the past when you try to race through this and push babies too fast, they often get readmitted and um, the nurses and the physicians that work in the pediatric intensive care unit for cardiology don't always see these babies come back. So we have to tell the story, but slow and steady wins the race. If we let parents know, look, this is a very normal thing that your baby will probably need supplemental nutrition even for a couple weeks. And then when we see you come back for your post-op check to have um, the sternum checked and everything, most of the time they're off the tube. Of course, some babies will need longer, babies that have syndromes, comorbidities, they may need more nutritional support. But um, tube weaning is the second most important thing for parents we've been told after surgery. They really don't wanna go home with that tube. And if I had to um, survey 100 parents, 100 parents would say they don't like the tube. But we know that the tube has a place that um, will help the baby heal for muscle um, strength, for brain development, and also for healing, healing after those lines and that um, scars that they, they'll get better healing with nutrition. And so since we've implemented a feeding journey handout and talking to our parents preoperatively and through the course of their stay, um, it's been better well received by physicians, nurses, and parents that, okay, maybe we need this NG for a little while till my little guy isn't falling asleep anymore and it won't stress me out that he's not getting enough. Um, I wanted to talk about a group that I started with a psychologist from um, Boston Children's Hospital. Her name's Samantha Butler. She's awesome. Her and I met about six years ago at a conference and the conference was talking about newborn care and then other conferences were talking about school age and each area of development is so important, but there was nothing specific for newborns with congenital heart and looking at neuroprotective and neural developmental care. So we started this group. Uh, this year we became a special interest group within the Cardiac Neurodevelopment Outcomes Collaborative. So you can join our SIG through there. We also have Twitter and Facebook. So check it out. Send us any questions that you might have or comments. We love to learn from each other. And um, this is a great group. We've started some projects. We recently submitted a paper and um, it was published through Cardiology in the Young. Courtney Jones is the author with Hema Desai. And we list some feeding challenges along with um, other things that impact feeding. And our next paper will look at interventions and therapeutic supports. You can reach Sam and I there. There are other national collaboratives, such as the Cardiac Neural Developmental Outcomes Collaborative, if you go to cardiacneural.org, National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaborative. The NPCQIC focuses on babies with hypoplastic left heart, 
and they not only look at infant but um, throughout the lifespan up to adulthood. There is great information on Congenital Heart Academy YouTube, not just for neural development, but cardiac defects, challenges in ICUs. There's all kinds of information if you check them out on YouTube. And then Cardiac Networks United, that is where many collaboratives come together to look at research and um, talk about ways to help families and infants with congenital heart defects. There's a lot of parent support groups. Mended Little Hearts or Mended Hearts, Conquering CHD, Sister by Heart. Um, again, that's for mostly infants with hypoplastic left heart. And then make sure your hospital has a program within parent support group. Um, we have beads of courage that are handed out through our child life, finding ways because this can be just as traumatic for a parent as it can be for a child. So before we go, I wanted to share some words of wisdom from a cardiac intensivist. You might be saying to yourself, how can I start a program within the cardiac um, ICU at my hospital? Where do I begin? And 10 years ago, we had a physician champion. Really, that was the key. And now we have nurse champions in the unit. We have nurse champions in our NICU. We have nurse champions in our PCICU. So let's um, hear what he has. Thank you for attending this conference. As a take home message, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your partners at your institution. Involve speech language pathology in all patients before and after surgery. Bring this to the attention of your team. Try to get partnership and buy-in from that team knowing that you will make a positive impact on your child's, on your patient's hospital course and future. If we can make that feeding experience a positive one, they are gonna be much stronger and have less feeding difficulties in the, in the post-operative period. I can guarantee that. They have been a great partnership with us and I would never go back. Thank you. So whether you're a speech therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, feeding therapist, psychologist, bring back this information, um, start your program. It's so important that all BBs at every institution get a standard care. And here's one of our nurses. Um, being a nurse in the PCICU, speech therapy is always by our sides to help improve outcomes with our families. Uh, we really rely on them a lot for um, getting the baby ready to PO feed and starting the feeding journey. So they will come in and work with families on, you know, starting with a pacifier and seeing how their skills are with the pacifier and how their suck and swallow is, to doing dips, to then doing uh, PO trials, and also obviously um, the swallow evaluations. It gives the families confidence to know that, you know, their baby is feeding safely and to look for all the cues that the baby may ha be having a hard time. So I think the families feel more confident when they work with our speech therapists um, to know that they're doing a good job um, and safely feeding their baby. As far as NG tubes go, that's always a huge stressor for families and speech therapy is always there to let them know that it, you know, most likely is a temporary thing and that, um, you know, they need the NG tube to get stronger so that they can build up the endurance to eventually, you know, be a fully um, bottle fed baby. They're also great with neuroprotective care. So they are there to, to support uh, the families and, you know, again, teach us the cues that the baby is maybe not ready to eat or having a little bit trouble regulating themselves. And then also they provide so much education to nurses. So also how we can safely feed the babies, looking at their cues, um, making sure that their position is good and that they're contained. So they really do so much um, for our unit and we would love to see so much more support. Um, as much as we can have them, we love them. That's Kathleen, one of our awesome nurses in the unit. Um, she's also a parent of an, a child with CHD. So I wanted to get her perspective on that as well. So as a parent to a child with CHD, um, for us, my daughter was intubated for a long time, pre-op for a month. And so she was low stimulation. I really didn't have a lot of opportunities to really give cares to her um, or comfort her much. We really kind of had to leave her alone. So um, 
I think having speech there uh, in that instance could have helped kind of show me ways to, you know, maybe do oral care with her or some ways to bond with her because I really did not have a lot of those. Um, and also she was not fed. So I think, um, you know, there's always an, a want to feed your child. I think that's normal. And so she wasn't able to be fed and she wasn't really able to be handled much. And so that was really difficult. Um, and then post-op, we did see speech uh, for oral motor uh, practice and things like that with uh, pacifier dips. And so we eventually got to like little bottle trials. So that was great. I think speech is um, a really important part of a journey in CHD as so many of our kids have um, feeding issues. So Kathleen's daughter is older. She's uh, 10 or 12. So it was interesting to find out the difference between how we were involved back then as compared to now. Um, and Kathleen is a wonderful nurse champion in our unit um, with our parents, nurses, medical staff. So we thank her very much. I want to thank you all today for listening to this lecture and taking the time to learn more about infants with congenital heart defects. It's truly been sort of a vocation for myself, getting to know these families. Um, I feel blessed to be there during their first feedings. I feel so like, it's like so, I can't describe it. Um, it's wonderful. It's, it's, a, it's a real neat opportunity and it feels like a special moment when you can be there and you can help a parent hold their baby, touch their baby, when you see that parent sitting in the corner just looking at their baby, say to yourself, you know what, it's a really busy, crazy day, but I'm gonna take a few extra minutes and, and I'm gonna show her that, you know what, you can hold his head, touch his hair, talk to him softly. I was in the unit last week and there was a great nurse and it took us over an hour to get the baby positioned in the mother's lap and get the milk and get the bottle. But I'll tell you what, when that mother started crying, the nurse and I looked at each other and we're like, yes, every day is a lot of challenges and more emails and more tasks to do, but this is what brings you to work. This is what makes it awesome to work with these families that if we can take those time and take that moment and be there for the parents, it really does make a difference for them. So thank you again for tuning in. Before we get with questions, I just have to commend you and someone had some wonderful thing to say about this presentation and I just want to read it because I think a lot of people feel this way about this group and um, someone wrote that this individualizes the challenges with this population, especially outside the NICU population. And these babies may be born full term with premature brains and whisked away during much of the developmental window. We must be in early, which you completely hit on the head you describe these challenges perfectly. So thank you, Jenny, for bringing that to all of our attention. Sure. Um, and now we can get to some questions. Um, one of the most common questions, of course, is about the oxygen. So um, people, uh, several people have asked about offering PO when the patient's on high flow, is that more negative experiences? And specifically about that, um, uh, what are the objectives you actually use to justify using that approach versus continuing just passy dips until they can show physi physiological stability on two liters? I know two liters is the big number. So how would you answer that? So thanks for asking that question. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy that surrounds it. There's been some studies that show that yes, they do aspirate on high flow. There's been some studies that show that it's more so low tone and base of tongue retraction strength. So I think the biggest piece here is the experience. Again, not just looking at numbers, um, looking at an experience with a parent. Um, this would not be a plan of care that would be handed off to be um, that the baby's gonna peel at every feeding or the baby's gonna peel so many times a day with a certain volume. This is looking at a neurological experience with an infant that's showing some interest with pacifier dips and a parent that um, 
is looking for an opportunity or an experience with their baby. So I should preface that this would be something that may be done once or twice a week with a parent at the bedside and a very small amount. And you would really look at all those factors because um, oral aversions are not just created from feeding. Oral aversions are mostly created by behavior of individuals that feel that once a baby takes a certain volume that, oh, let's push that volume, let's give more. In my 25 years of experience, um, what I have found is that oral aversions really are created by the people um, and what kind of experiences they provide that baby and that child, not so much the baby's um, medical condition. So um, I would love to get a grant to look at this more. Um, I've applied for some. Sometimes when you're at bigger institutions, you get more money. Um, but I definitely think this is an area that needs to be further researched. But I wouldn't not look at a number and say that I wouldn't provide an opportunity. I think a highly skilled therapist, and I wanted to reiterate, we have PTs, OTs, and speech therapists providing feeding therapy. So thank you all for um, supporting these infants. But um, this is a method that you would look at, A, the flow rate and make it the very smallest flow rate, B, positioning, um, pacing, and you would do it in the most safe, positive, um, cherished way possible with a parent. This is not something I would always do without a parent. I think this is a full circle experience. Thank you. Um, another question about the specifics in your program, are your therapists only dedicated to the cardiac unit or to other units as well? That's a great question. Um, I wish we were only dedicated in the unit. I could uh, be up there definitely for the whole day. Um, right now, we have a staff that rotates through there. I also cover our NICU, our PICU, um, our cardiac neurodevelopmental clinic, our high risk cl clinic, um, and I do other responsibilities at work too. Um, it is challenging um, when you wanna start a program to find the support staff but through education and looking at quality improvement and our institution being involved with these um, collaboratives, we've been able to increase the support in our unit. So please reach out if you're looking for more ideas about how to start a neurodevelopmental program um, in your unit and um, our SIG uh, that I mentioned, our cardiac newborn group, um, we can help you there too. Thank you. And you're right. It's not, it's not just creating a feeding program, but creating a neurodevelopmental program. So that's great. The three strikes you're out. So is that three occurrences during one feeding or three separate feedings? Can you describe that a little bit more in detail? Great question. Um, so my colleagues, um, Barbara Butler and Lisa Duty created this. Um, it's been a great tool that we've used at our institute, not just with our cardiac infants, but our NICU infants, any um, child that's having some feeding difficulties. So um, with the three strikes you're out, we educate the parents in regards to aspiration risks and concerns, signs and symptoms. Um, and then we um, give, so it's sort of like the getting your feet wet. Um, we're going to try three times. And if the baby shows three stress cues, then we stop at that point, And then we wait for another opportunity. It may be at the next feeding. It may be two feedings later. If the baby's drowsy or sedation's impacting their alertness, it could be the next day. We just use that as a tool to teach parents like, um, you know, I know you seem excited and your baby's sucking, but um, I see some stress cues. And the more we can empower the parent and get the parent on our side, the feedings generally go much better and tube weaning happens faster. So kind of related to that, how are you promoting or what, what can you tell us about direct breastfeeding with these babies? So um, preoperatively, um, some uh, and within the collaborative, I've talked to other institutions. So preoperatively, mom doesn't have much milk, right? Her milk's starting to come in. So we're really looking at more skin to skin, um, suckling at the breast. Our institute uses donor milk. Um, so sometimes parents will alternate breast and bottle um, with a feeding with a slow flow um, nipple. And then postoperatively, um, it is harder to bring the baby to breast if they have a chest tube and uh, lines. But every baby at our institute, if the mother wants to breastfeed, they get a lactation consult before they go home and the baby's brought to breast um, a couple times. So even though they may not be able to nutritionally support themselves, we always support the family. 
Um, all right, we have time for one more question. So don't worry if your question didn't get answered when the recording, and it is being recorded, somebody else asked that question. It will all be posted along with the Q&A. We're gonna address every question eventually. So we just don't have time. There are so many questions. <laughs> Um, do you follow your baby's feeding outcomes on a long-term basis? And do you have any data for that? So we do through our cardiac neurodevelopmental clinic, um, our infants come back at six months. Um, and then we submit that data to the cardiac neurodevelopmental outcomes, um, database. So, um, I don't have specific data for my Institute right now, but we do keep track of our infants, um, with their feeding. Okay. Thank you. Um, and remember everyone that, uh, again, the questions will be posted, but Jenny did provide her um, email. So I know she's very um, willing to talk to, to all you with these questions. There's so much conversation that can be had. So I just wanna thank you again for being here. It's a pleasure to work with you. And um, I love your passion for this topic and I'm excited to see what you continue to do with all your research. So thank you for being here today. We are honored. And as we wrap up this presentation, Dr. Brown's Medical just wants to thank all of you for being here and for taking your valuable time and spending with us. Our next webinar will address early intervention issues in honor of, in the spring, there's both OT month and um, speech and hearing month. So we're excited to address some early intervention topics. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.